Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Kate Gollum Forum. Now we'll proceed to panel discussion one, a new cold war, democracy versus authoritarianism. There are four panelists in this part, respectively, from Japan, Germany, Australia, and France. Now, please join me in welcoming our moderator, president of the Prospect Foundation, Lai Yizhong. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, now, <clears throat> we come to the uh, first session. Uh, the uh, title of the session is about the new Cold War, Democracy versus Authoritarian. Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, our panelists. Uh, we have four distinguished panelists. Uh, the first one on my right-hand side is the uh, former Minister of Defense of Australia, Kevin Andrews. And then uh, we will follow with the uh, uh, Professor uh, Tanikuchi Tomohiko uh, from the uh, uh, Graduate School of System Design and Management at the Keio University, Japan. Uh, Taniguchi Tomohiko is also uh, a close associate with the former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo, and uh, uh, he has uh, been Prime Minister Abe Shinzo, his uh, foreign policy advisor, um, for long years. And then uh, next, uh, it will be followed by uh, Dr. Heinrich Kraft, a seasoned a German uh, diplomat. And now the, uh, Professor Kraft is the professor and the director of the Center for Diplomacy at the University in Budapest, in Hungary. And last but not the least, uh, will be followed by a French professor, also a longtime friend of Taiwan, a longtime friend of myself, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Stefan uh, Korkov. He is associate professor, science uh, for Lyon at the IEP Lyon, France. This session. Uh, title, The uh, Cold War, Democracy versus Authoritarian. I believe that all of us know this year the uh, war in Ukraine and the China-Russia corporations, the kind of no limit uh, announcement in their common statement, mark a very different era of this, glo of this world. Last year, when we talk about U.S.-China competition, basically people are still thinking about how to manage competition uh, so that uh, it will be competition without catastrophes. But now, with the war, full-scale war on Ukraine by the Russia and the China-Russia axis that seems to be informing, we're actually believing, uh, looking at uh, the uh, realization of the block-like uh, power and the competitions especially uh, what we see along the line of the uh, Euro-Asia land power centered around China, Russia, and now a follow with the co cooperation in Iran and probably with North Korea and Pakistan. And then uh, there is the uh, Euro-Asia maritime power in which led by United States uh, on the east side of the Eurasian continent. Uh, outside of the Eurasian continent uh, will be Japan, Australia, uh, and then in the south side, it will be the, uh, India, and also from the west side, you will see the whole Europe uh, center around European Union and uh, crystallized through the NATO alliances. And uh, this, the kind of the new blockization of the competitions, uh, although it signifies the kind of the uh, geopolitical competition which uh, people tended to look at through the uh, paradigm uh, in the past, uh, manifest by the, in, in the thesis of the McKinder versus Nicholas Spickman. But on the other hand, it also represents the very real, the value competitions. So that, and uh, we also noticed that uh, this morning, in both President Tsai's speech and also uh, Kono Talo, a former uh, foreign minister of Japan's speech, also indicated that the kind of the value differences and the competition right now, that is at the center of everything. And so that without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, former Minister of Defense of Australia, Kevin Andrews, to give your, your thought about this issue. So Kevin, please. Uh, Mr. President, uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, dear friends, can I thank the Prospect Foundation and the government of Taiwan for the opportunity to participate in this forum? And can I particularly acknowledge at the outset 
our dear friends from Japan and extend our condolences on the death of the late Prime Minister uh, Abe. And uh, can I acknowledge the very special relationship between Australia and Taiwan, uh, not just an economic trading relationship, but a warm relationship between two peoples. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is involved in a new Cold War. This war was launched and is being prosecuted by the Chinese Communist regime under the leadership of President Xi Jinping. And she is adamant that this is a contest between authoritarianism and democracy. In November 2020, she told President-elect Biden that, and I quote, democracies cannot be sustained in the 21st century. Autocracies will run the world. Why? Things are changing so rapidly. Democracies require consensus and it takes time and you don't have time. She uses Cold War language to describe his objectives. In April 2021, the Chinese Communist Party's People's Daily newspaper highlighted a then newly published book, Questions and Answers on the Study of Xi Jinping Thought on Socialism with Chinese Characteristics for a New Era. This book is replete with Cold War rhetoric. The world is described as a field for competition between two ideologies and two social systems. History, it says, should be interpreted through the fundamental point of view of historical materialism, and truth will be found by applying Marxist tools. This truth being the truth of Marxism as formulated by Marx himself. And like Marx, she is convinced that communism will prevail. According to the Chinese leader, China is, and I quote, at the centre of the world stage, and the historical evolution and competition in the world between two ideologies is being solved in favour of Marx, unquote. He also accuses nations that promote democracy, human rights, and the rule of law of causing wars, chaos, and human displacement around the world. In a recently released readout of his remarks to a Politburo study session in February of this year, she asserted that some Western nations forcibly promote the concept and system of Western democracy and human rights taking advantage of human rights issues to interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. And although she has referred to democracy, quote, with Chinese characteristics, he rejects the central tenets of it. Speaking last year, the chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress enunciated in detail what she had previously outlined. Mr. Lee listed five ideas that are rejected by the CCP, namely, and I quote, so-called constitutionalism, multi-party elections, the division of powers, the bicameral system, and the independence of the judiciary, unquote. What, I ask, remains of democracy after the removal of these fundamental pillars? At the most basic level, the vast majority of the Chinese people have never had the opportunity to vote for their leadership under the CCP. The CCP also seeks to eliminate the very institutions that undergird democracy, free public discussion and civil association. Because at the core of authoritarianism is a belief that the political realm trumps all other spheres of human endeavour. So it's naive to think that this Cold War is avoidable. It is currently being prosecuted. There are obvious features of this war apart from the constant rhetorical jousts of its perpetrators. The use of force is threatened regularly. And from time to time, force is used, such as in the Himalayas. 
Threats, both physical and intimidatory, are employed. Threatening wolf warrior diplomacy has become a feature of CCP statements. Chinese military aircraft regularly breach the air warning zones of other nations and have dangerously intercepted aircraft in international space. The CCP has also claimed recently that the whole of the Taiwan Strait belongs to China, contrary to all historical fact and international laws. And she recently authorised 59 new articles that seek to legitimise the CCP's external use of force in other nations. Authoritarians utilise every instrument available to them, including trade sanctions and the ongoing cyber warfare. And they cooperate with other authoritarians when it suits their cause. China's current support for Russia is an obvious example. So, dear friends, how do we respond? First, we need the intellectual clarity and the moral courage to call out this Cold War and to name the perpetrators. This is not some great game. It is a real threat to the peace and security of the world, no more so than in this country and in this region. Secondly, like-minded nations must defend democracy against its authoritarian attackers. Fundamental principles, sorry, they must recognise that the authoritarian rulers of China will never willingly share power. They refute the practice in their own country and would do so abroad. Whatever its faults, liberal democracy remains the best chance to uphold the dignity and freedom of the individual, to nourish human flourishing and to promote peace and stability. It is therefore worth defending. Thirdly, nations must continue to uphold and defend universal human rights and the rule of law. And this includes responding to the flouting of international agreements and the manipulation of international organisations. Fourthly, like-minded nations must act in unison with other democratic nations and states against authoritarian regimes. We must be clear that force will be resisted. As former Japanese President Abe has said, there should be no strategic ambiguity about this fundamental principle. In this context, they must recognise that Taiwan is the first chain of defence in the fight against the authoritarian CCP. If China was to invade Taiwan, the ramifications for the world, including Japan and Australia, are enormous. It must be clear that any attempted invasion of Taiwan will be resisted militarily by allied nations. But more than strategic clarity, we need cooperative capability across a range of areas, starting with intelligence gathering and sharing and planning and interoperable exercises. That does not mean that democratic nations pursue war. To the contrary, our objective should be to maintain peace, but that will only be achieved through strength and deterrence, not appeasement. And fifthly, they should identify and warn susceptible nations of the dangers of colonisation by authoritarian states and support them in resistance to this assault on their freedoms. Finally, in my necessarily incomplete list, they must match Chinese propaganda both in their own countries and elsewhere with a spirited defence of democracy and freedom. What the CCP fears most is the fate of the Soviet Union, which fell ultimately not from external force, but from an unquenchable desire for freedom by many of its own people. In this context, we should never underestimate the power of the human spirit. Contrary to what Mr Xi says, there are many good reasons to believe that his assertion that authoritarianism will prevail is incorrect that in fact democracy will prevail in the 21st century, but it will not be without a struggle. As an opponent of authoritarianism in the past, Vaclav Havel once said, the only struggle that is lost is the one that we have given up on. Dear friends, this is a struggle that all believers in human dignity 
individual freedom and democracy must engage in. Thank you. Thank you, Minister <coughs> Kevin Andrews. Uh, what you said is actually very clear. And also you touch upon a very interesting issue about how, the clear, how clear it has to be uh, in terms of defending Taiwan. I think that begs another round of discussions. So next, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Taniguchi Tomihiko, uh, Professor of Graduate School of System Design and Management at the Keio University, also a very good friend of mine, and Taiwan Prospect Foundation. So, Professor uh, Taniguchi Tomihiko, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Lai. And it's um, an honor and a pleasure to meet you, albeit online. First, I must thank by, I must begin by thanking all of you for your words of condolences and sympathy to the late Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe, with whom I spent uh, the last 10 plus years. I know that he was very much interested in coming to <coughs> Taiwan and addressing some of the important think tanks and intellectual community in Taiwan. Taiwan was among the most important issues that he was very much determined to spend his political capital on going forward. He was ready to be provocative. He was uh, ready to be able to write more such stuff as he contributed to Project Syndicate, part of which was um, quoted by His Excellency uh, Minister Kevin Andrews, whose remarks I hear were very much uh, uh, comprehensive and thought-provoking. Now, Shinzo Abe sought to forge a peace treaty, finally, with Vladimir Putin, simply because Japan could not afford coping with uh, three threats from three fronts all at the same time. His intent was to reduce the threat from the north and by so doing concentrate the limited amount of defense resources to the south west, namely Taiwan and around its region. He ultimately ended up unable to complete the peace treaty because at the end of the day, Vladimir Putin was among very few in Russia who was interested in striking a deal with the Japanese. And um, to uh, the surprise of many in Tokyo, Vladimir Putin was not necessarily a quintessential dictator, but more an organization, institution man. Anyhow, uh, Japan-Russia relationships have come a full circle. And as a result, this country, unlike any other big nation among OECD nations, is faced with three militarist nuclear powers, none of which has exercised anything akin to open democracy, namely Russia, North Korea, China. With that in mind, my remarks uh, would be rather short. The late Prime Minister Abe Shinzo hoisted a banner of freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, highly aware that China suffers from chronic shortages of ideas and ideals that inspire, intrigue, and motivate humans who by nature seek no oppression, no suppression, but more freedom. To fill the big void that is the absence of universally accepted values, 
Beijing must always resort to sheer power of coercion, backed by its economic predominance and its growing military arsenal. The next five years, ladies and gentlemen, for that matter, will be the most crucial period in which Japan, the United States, Australia, India, Taiwan, and other freedom-loving nations should join forces together, both militarily and politically. The Chinese propaganda machine will concentrate its power to manipulate the upcoming Taiwanese presidential election due in 2024. Three years after that in 2027, Xi Jinping's credentials as the supreme leader, will be severely examined, while the PLA, People's Liberation Army, celebrating its centenary. Mr. Xi would be keener than ever before to somehow annex Taiwan for the fulfillment of his version of China dream. <coughs> Taiwan should seek to join as many international fora as possible with the help and support from Japan, the United States, etc., etc. Taiwan, being a non-state state and non-member of the United States, could expect much reduced help from the rest of the world, many countries of which fear China's nuclear power, and economic retaliations. It boils down, therefore, to Japan and the United States that could act to protect Taiwan. I should elaborately be provocative in calling the Taiwanese leaders, both in and out of government, to not abandon but at least shelve their long-standing claim over the Senkakus. For, without doubt, the issue is a handy tool Beijing could use as a wedge that divides the two great democratic nations of Japan and Taiwan apart. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Professor <clears throat> Taniguchi Tomohiko, um, about uh, your description regarding how the uh, democ democracy work together. And I think that uh, your last uh, suggestions, uh, which uh, in various occasions you also mentioned in uh, different forums, I believe that has been loud and clear and has been uh, discussed or uh, they're taking some uh, positions uh, by this government. So next, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Heinrich Kraft uh, from Germany, uh, but right now he's residing in Hungary as a professor of the Diplomacy at the University in Dupas. So, uh, Dr. Kraft, the floor is yours. Dear President Lai, thank you very much for your kind words and for your invitation to your prestigious forum. I'm very privileged to participate in, in your panel speaking after Minister Andrews and, uh, of course, my longtime friend, uh, Professor Taniguchi, whom I know since I served at our embassy in Tokyo some 30 years ago. Well, I'm very privileged to give you a European, especially a German view, on the topic of our panel, A New Cold War Democracy, versus authoritarianism. With Russia's attack on Ukraine, a new Cold War, which was building up between authoritarian and democratic countries over the past years, this new Cold War has turned into a first hot war. Putin has turned his country into a more and more authoritarian regime, some already call it a full-fledged dictatorship. The authoritarian Russia 
has launched a large scale attack on Ukraine, a country which had opted, which had opted for turning itself into a liberal democracy. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has openly, has openly stated just two days ago, Russia wants regime change in Kiev. Russia wants to unseat democratically elected President Zelensky and his government and to do away, to do away with liberal democracy there. Russia pretends to fight NATO, to, pretends to fight the US and Ukraine, but it's not NATO. It's not the US Putin fears most. It's freedom and democracy itself he fears. And it's the strong resolve, the strong willingness of the Ukrainian people to preserve their freedom, their democracy, and their sovereignty, which motivates them to stand up against a militarily much superior enemy. Today, authoritarian rule is challenging democracy as dominant model on the global scale. In the wake of Russia's invasion, President Joe Biden said, we are engaged anew in a great battle for freedom, a battle between democracy and autocracy, between liberty and repression. Britain's Foreign Secretary Liz Truss promised to end the accommodation of trade and economic growth with authoritarian regimes. And German Chancellor Olaf Scholz spoke of a Zeitenwende, the beginning of a new era in which democracies have to stand together and defend freedom and their democratic values. He declared an extraordinary additional investment in German defense of 100 billion euros. Also, the European Union's new strategic compass, which was agreed upon earlier this year, notes that security policy must now be framed around, I cite, competition of governance systems. Regarding China, the EU's High Representative for Foreign Affairs, Joseph Borrell, already declared two years ago that China remains a partner in certain areas, such as fighting climate change, that China is a fierce competitor, especially in the economic field, but that China also had become a systemic rival, a systemic rival challenging democratic values all around the globe. Currently, we see a reinvigorated commitment to defending the liberal order. The war in Ukraine is part of a broader battle for democracy and against autocratic and illiberal values. Many new strands of policy coordination are taking shape between democratic governments across the world. 40 countries, including not only European countries and the United States, but also Australia, Japan, Kenya, New Zealand, and South Korea have formed the Ukraine Consultative Group. Western leaders have reached out to India and promised to coordinate more effectively around its concerns about authoritarian action by China. The EU and the United States have intensified their diplomatic efforts with Latin American countries too. At their summit in May, 2022, the European Union and Japan committed, a greater, committed to greater coordination on global affairs among themselves, but also, of course, with the United States. While the democracy-autocracy divide is set to become more consequential, there are and there will be powerful dynamics that also will dilute it somewhat. We see on one side this more, this new idealistic commitment to democracy, but the new context is pushing at least some Western states and other democracies also towards greater pragmatism. In Europe, we have seen discussions about how to drive a wedge between Russia and China. Some even dream of China as a possible broker of a ceasefire, if not a peace agreement between Russia and Ukraine. I think this is not very realistic given that China is even supporting Russia's war against Ukraine. India and South Korea abstained in the United Nations resolution on the invasion. Among the governments that refused to condemn Russia were many that only two months earlier had participated in the US-led summit for democracy and pledged more 
coordination between democracies. The uh, 141 states that voted to condemn Russia in the United Nations included also many non-democracies. Not all democracies lined up against Russia and not all autocracies lined up behind it. Rather than two homogeneous blocks of democracies and autocracies facing off against each other, international politics will look like more like a messy set of overlapping centers of power and shifting alliances. Even if it does not become the dominant driver of international relations, as some think, the democracy-autocracy divide, at least in my eyes, will assume a higher profile as a result of the war in Ukraine. And this momentum, this momentum should be maintained, should be maintained to make our democracies more resilient at home and to support struggling democracies abroad and strengthen democratic movements where they are under pressure. From Ukraine to the Solomon Islands, Russia and China are using force and varying methods of subversion to co-opt, to supplant, to hollow out democratically elected governments to serve their own interests. By equipping authoritarian leaders with the technology, the expertise, and also with funds to suppress dissent and extend their rule in exchange for favorable UN votes, access to natural resources or other concessions, Moscow and Beijing are both supporting authoritarian expansion. Moscow and Beijing use economic coercion, they use election interference and opaque deal-making with more expensive and more aggressive moves to shape critical domains from internet freedom to the basic tenets of sovereignty. This is creating an environment that is fundamentally hostile to democratic values. President Biden has said that we are now finally waking up to the challenge posed by transnational authoritarianism. European leaders have come to similar conclusions. The de democratic world is more dedicated than since a long time to defend democracies and democratic values and push back authoritarianism. Defending democracy is critical to building a free, a secure, a prosperous world. We must now pursue policies that strengthen and empower fledging democratic institutions and deter our adversaries from their campaigns of malign foreign influence. According to Freedom House, only two in 10 people live in free countries. Taiwanese and Germans can be happy to belong to this shrinking group of countries. For democracies, it is more important than ever to support each other, to support each other against this growing threat of authoritarianism. And as we have seen in Eastern Europe, large scale, large scale military aggression. That's why Germany and other European countries are standing up against the Russian aggression. And we are supporting Ukrainians who are defending their freedom and their democracy. And that's also why Germany, France and others and the European Union as a whole are seeking to strengthen our ties, including in the security area with the democracies around the globe, including in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Kraft, uh, for your remarks. And I particularly liked uh, what you said regarding the, uh, the, uh, the need for the closer cooperation between the democracy and also the delusion about trying to drive the wedge between Russia and China, which I believe this is very, very true and should drive many other policy issues that we design for both Russia and China. Now, next, uh, I'd like to invite uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Stefan Kokrov. Uh, from France uh, to give us uh, your thought. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. President, dear uh, uh, Yijong, distinguished, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, I, I am very honored, of course, to be here and I would like to uh, thank you very much 
for this invitation. Um, in contrast to the realist school of uh, international relations and what it may suggest, um, I think that values may have become the key issue in the configuration of the world uh, which is coming and which is marked by geopolitical tensions between democratic and authoritarian regimes with many types of hybrid regimes in between. In this new world configuration, China has become a key player. <clears throat> the country is doing something that has never seen that has never seen before, the reconstruction of its totalitarianism, whereas all previous totalitarian regimes ultimately failed and disappeared. And while PRC itself had changed its totalitarianism of the Mao era in a form of hard uh, authoritarianism. So re-totalitarizing China is being done today with the help of economic strength and multiple new technologies of social control that former, uh, uh, authori um, that former totalitarian regimes did not enjoy. In the Nazi era, Soviet Union, and even in the Mao era of China, the regimes did not have those tools that, could, that can today uh, help PRC to uh, <clears throat> propose a form of um, totalitarianism 2.0, which is totally new. And the, media, the building of this model, if it's exported widely in the world, will run directly against the values that have shaped the world order after the Second World War. And it's interesting to remind that there was a time when China was not fighting these values internationally, but on the contrary, contributed to them by participating to the establishment of this new liberal world, uh, and of course I mean here the Republic of China, which signed the United Nations Charter in 1945, and did contribute to the, re, uh, to the uh, drafting of the International Declaration of Human Rights by sending a delegation of three philosophers and lawyers in Geneva in 1948. Speaking about values is important because this brings us to the root of the difference between regimes. The consciousness of this appears to have um, been surprisingly widely forgotten after the demise of the Soviet Union. And this appears especially true when we look back on three decades of cooperation with the People's Republic of China. To be fair, however, it should be said that the democratic model, the democratic model of polity is undermined not only by illiberal regimes, but also within democratic societies themselves where the founding values of uh, liberal political systems are often subject to many manipulations by various actors. And this surely doesn't help the liberal model uh, in this competitive international market of values and models. In addition, the promotion of our system faces ine inevitably criticism by many in the world against our regimes. These perceptions, of course, are based on insufficient information, jealousy, ideological consideration, religious projects, etc. But all this is being systematically interpreted within a simple frame. What is viewed as the original sin of the West, colonization and imperialism. We know that calculation and manipulations of opinions are, of course, part of this problem. But we cannot avoid facing the fact that the West is not trusted and is subject of suspicion everywhere. And China is an excellent example of this psychotic admiration, jealousy, hate view 
of a globalized West. Our model needs, in consequence, to speak for itself by the excellency of its results, efficiency of the political decision and planning, social stability and redistribution, and a win-win mix of economic health um, and environmental protection, etc. As we all know, it's a challenge, and not only for our models, but also for dictatorships and authoritarian regimes. Many people throughout the democratic world have a poor understanding of the complexity of political decision and of the difficulty of managing a country. It is less and less uncommon to hear in countries like, like mine, France, people to denounce their regime as being dictatorships, having no idea of what a real dictatorship is. We know the factors uh, behind this. Populist discourses on the right and on the left, a poor uh, understanding of politics, the increasing replacement of, journal of professional journalism by social media information, the dissemination of fake news, and the false idea that authoritarian countries are more efficient in, manage in the management of some issues. The irony here is that those who criticize democracies by qualifying them as dictatorships can be the same who value dictatorships, the real ones this time, by pretending that they can be more efficient than democracies in dealing with some issues. In, a, in, 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 one, in one word, distinctions are increasing, increasingly blurred, and this is very problematic. Of course, a global competition of values between democracies and authoritarian regimes was already uh, uh, seen uh, and, and was already a main reason uh, during the East-West confrontation and the Cold War. However, there are key differences between uh, that period and now. First, ideologies count less in alignment on one or on the other side, and paradoxically, paradoxically, this will not help democracy uh, to progress in the world. Second, China's economy, though it shows signs of increasing weaknesses, is still very strong and has reached out the whole world in the absence of an official division of th that world in two blocks, as it was during the Cold War. Third, power, including the power of nuisance, is disseminated, fragmented, and localized <clears throat> to an extent that has never been seen before. In other words, showing the co coherence of our model is in itself a challenge, whether the model is performing well or not. We should not be necessarily pessimistic all the time, however, we do not see today an ideological alignment on China by countries entering, for instance, its Belt and Road Initiative. And instead, we see a pragmatic, even though it's often badly calculated, establishment of economic links. And this drains substantial Chinese financial resources and can, can backlash when the reality of the Chinese real interests behind these schemes and investments appear clearly. And we have this recent example of Sri Lanka, which is quite interesting, and which made me wonder since quite a while whether China is not creating what it has denounced for decades as the century of humiliation, and precisely doing the same, which is foreign concessions for herself abroad. With such a challenge, our regimes, if they want to survive, are forced, and partially by this uh, challenge of non-democratic regimes, uh, to make uh, progress and to become both representative and participative, and to be excellent on every issue, having to be uh, a model. And Taiwan, from this point of view, is doing, I think, pretty well. So we need to find a way to promote democracy as being efficient, but without 
appearing to be pro proselytizing due to this image of the West that I just described. So Europe and the United States are, as, are strongly resented in the world for the colonial past of the one and the status of superpower of the other. Of course, there are other democratic countries that don't count, that doesn't count in this, uh, 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 in this scheme of having a colonial past of, or uh, having a, a status of uh, 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 superpower today. And I have in mind Canada or Australia. But, but anyway, these countries will uh, uh, necessarily be associated uh, to the West in this uh, global scheme of a sim simple, uh, of the simple scheme of a uh, West against the rest. So, so we must absolutely rely, if we want to help democracy shine, on non-European, non-American democratic countries. That is why Taiwan is absolutely key for the defense of democracy. Um, we know that Taiwan, of course, is a pivot in this Indo-Pacific balance uh, as the first target of China. And uh, it's an undeniable fact, undeniable fact. But my modest contribution to this debate is to remind that uh, this in undeniable fact is still denied and still uh, uh, avoided by many uh, in the world. And so, if we can just show to the world that we need to rely on non-European or non-American uh, countries uh, to show that democracy is efficient and is a good uh, uh, model for the world, then Taiwan can play this role because the Taiwanese democracy is indeed very vibrant and uh, that could help legislators around, legislators around the world to pressure uh, executive powers to make courageous uh, decisions and to see uh, clearly that Taiwan is a uh, geopolitical boundary for democracy today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor <coughs> Stefan Kokrov. Uh, especially at the end that you talk about how the uh, Taiwan, I think also the Japan and Korea as well, uh, prove to that the uh, democracy is not just a Western value, it crossed the uh, cultural boundaries. It's not like uh, what Xi Jinping said, that it's democracy is the uh, uh, culture bias institutions. Uh, it's actually a universal, uh, it, it has a universal appeal based on universal, universal values. And then uh, <clears throat> we'd like to uh, go to our uh, Q&A, but basic conversation uh, sessions. I think all of us, all of you, talk about the uh, strengthening of the uh, cooperation of democracy, uh, vitally important uh, right now. And in Taiwan, we also watch the development of the war in Ukraine very, very uh, con uh, cosently. Uh, of course, we tried everything uh, so that uh, the uh, uh, war in Ukraine uh, would not uh, lead to the directly that Taiwan will be the next. And as the president said this morning, uh, the reason why she cannot be here today uh, with us in person is that she's riding with our Navy and outside uh, to demonstrate about the importance of the uh, strengthening Taiwan's national defense. So we are doing our part on this. But then, the, uh, as the Ukraine war in Ukraine started to uh, reach the, the certain the current stalemate, and uh, the um, people are expecting that could be uh, we are looking at the longer term of the war in Ukraine, and uh, we started to see uh, some of the uh, uh, issue about the sustainability and the resilience of the support from the Russian democracy for the Ukraine. Because right now, people started to experience the rising energy crisis, uh, the food issues, and all those started to uh, question about how the democracy should they bond together, would the society be able to sustain uh, the kind of needing sacrifices to continue the struggle for the Ukraine to resist the, the Russian and even to push back about Russian aggressions. So the, so the question I'd like to present to all of you is that uh, with the, the current issue like this, how, we, how the democracy is able to actually work together facing the uh, current crisis 
uh, in terms of the economy, that has been uh, uh, there's a, a tremendous cost among the general public within a democracy about how to uh, continue support and uh, build up the, uh, our own resilience to uh, continue our way of life in support of the uh, struggle for the Ukraine. Because the, uh, the way it play out also have a tremendous implication for Taiwan as well. So I'd like to present this uh, question to all of you. Um, can I first ask uh, the, the minister, uh, Andrew, uh, to, uh, to answer, and then uh, followed by the uh, Professor Taniguchi and then Professor Kraft, and also my good friend Stefan. Thank you. Um, a couple of reflections, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first is an historical truism, and that is that wars are much more easy to begin than they are to conclude. Um, one only has to look back a century ago to the Great War, which just dragged on and on and on for years because there was not found to be a way of ending that war. The purpose of a war is usually to obtain victory or to be in a sufficiently strong position to sue for peace. And the problem in the Ukraine is that neither are happening at the present time. And to be frank, I don't think we know what the outcome uh, will be. Uh, it's still, I think, in the offing. Um, but what is important, I think, for democracies is that if there is sufficient resilience amongst their populace, and that resilience is supported by good national leadership, and that national leadership in turn has the support of other democracies around the world in terms of actual military capabilities, then democracies can succeed against authoritarian regimes. It's widely said that President Putin believed that he could march into or march his tank columns into Ukraine and it would all be over within a week. Here we are many, many months later when that's not the case, but it may well have been so had not other countries, perhaps a little reluctantly at first, but I think with increasing a clarity, uh, have been willing to support militarily with equipment and other means the fight by the Ukrainians against Russia. Thank you. And then Professor Taniguchi, would you like to uh, a response? Right. First and foremost, we must lose no confidence in our democratic systems. Sixteen days ago, Shinzo Abe had to die an unnecessary death. Since that time, national elections took place peacefully for the nation's upper chamber, and there is no actually prospect of Japan going something like uh, undemocratic. Democratic institutions take uh, generations, not even years, but generations to mature, but once mature, uh, they don't go away. For, in contrast, if you put yourself into the shoes of Xi Jinping, would you be able to feel that your country, your status would be predictable and secure? I don't think so. Further, let me just um, introduce something that I did recently. That's a very quick search using newspaper database, one of the biggest databases called Nexus Uni. And I was curious because I have seen fewer still coverage, uh, fewer still articles covering um, One Belt, One Road, Old Boar. So I chose uh, years such as 2015, 16, 17, up till uh, 2021 and 2022, and I put a simple search term of one belt, one road. And that uh, keyword draw, 8,300 articles in 2015, 9869 articles 2016, 
10,000 plus for three consecutive years of 2017, 18, 2019. However, in 2020, the key term of one, one belt, one road, only draw, only 3,175, 3,175 articles. Last year, 2021, the same, 3,300. And this year, uh, this year would be something like uh, also 3,400. What happened between 2029 and 2020? G7 nations gathered and proposed something called quality, quality investment. Well, I must say uh, humbly that uh, the concept was led by uh, the late uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe himself uh, also. Uh, at the occasion of um, uh, G7 summit meetings that the uh, Jap Japanese government hosted in uh, 2016. Now, uh, the Chinese themselves don't speak much about OBOR anymore. I think this is um, a clear indication that if you succeed in putting together your democratic forces and intellectual capital, you could uh, push back some of those uh, concepts and ideas that China, in a very much unilateral and uh, neo-imperialistic uh, way, has uh, pushed toward some of those um, uh, developing nations. Um, someone mentioned Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka would be remembered as a classic uh, example of a failure uh, that that was caused by the country um, succumbing pretty much into the uh, uh, course that uh, China uh, urged them to take. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, uh, Professor Tomohiko, <clears throat> uh, for your uh, remarks. Now, next, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Kraft, uh, if you'd like to say something. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, President Lai. Well, I, I totally agree with the assessment uh, of uh, uh, Minister Andrews. Um, we have to prepare for a, a long war in, in, in Ukraine. Um, it's not uh, visible uh, how and when this war um, can end. Uh, so resilience of uh, support for Ukraine, uh, for Ukrainian democracy is, uh, is crucial. Well, everybody knows that Germany was over-dependent on, on Russian gas and everybody agrees that this was a mistake. Um, well, we have to recall that during the Soviet Union, during the old Cold War, um, uh, the Soviet Union was a reliable exporter of gas to um, uh, to, to Germany and to, to other parts of, of Europe. So um, many thought that, uh, that uh, the, the new Russia, the Putin's Russia, would at least be as, um, as a, positive, uh, um, a positive partner than uh, the old Soviet Union. Uh, but this was definitely a mistake. And uh, yes, um, we have a huge debate in, in Germany about uh, well about freezing about freezing uh, during uh, the next uh, winter and uh, yes uh, putin is uh, is blackmailing us uh, blackmailing us uh, uh, opening and and, and closing uh, the existing uh, Nord stream 1 uh, uh, pipeline but i think discussing this now heavily in the german media in the german public is preparing the people for for um, a cold uh, winter. And uh, if, um, if we can draw already one conclusion out of uh, the, um, the, um, um, the war in Ukraine, it is that Putin overestimated the strength of his, his army, of his military, that Putin underestimated uh, heavily the willingness of the Ukrainian people to defend their sovereignty, their democracy, and their freedom. And he also underestimated 
the resolve of the United States, of the European countries, of the European Union, of their unity and their willingness to stand by with, um, uh, with, uh, with the Ukrainians. And uh, yes, it's true that Germany was weak on uh, defense. Um, so we had, uh, we enjoyed uh, decades of uh, reaping what we called uh, the uh, peace dividend after the old Cold War came to an end and we, um, we downsized the, uh, the, uh, the, the German uh, military, we got rid of uh, the, the draft, uh, etc. But all this has been turned around. And I, uh, I talked about this uh, Zeitenwende that our chancellor talked about. Uh, and it was exactly this, this government, um, um, including the Green Party, which, uh, which uh, um, was founded not only on, uh, on ecological uh, roots, but also was founded as a peace party. So this party is particularly strong standing up against the authoritarian aggression, against the Putin's uh, aggression. Germany is now even sending heavy weaponry to, uh, to Russia, uh, to, sorry, to, to Ukraine to fight Russian aggression, including howitzers and, uh, and, and, and tanks. And uh, if somebody would have mentioned this um, uh, some six months ago, uh, everybody would have said, this is impossible. And this shows the resolve of Germany, the, shows the resolve of Europeans to stand up against authoritarian aggression uh, in Europe. And I can assure everybody, uh, we will be standing next to everybody who is also standing up against aggression of authoritarian regimes. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kraft. Now, uh, Stefan, would you like to say something? Well, it's difficult to uh, add something after all what has been said, and especially on such a difficult uh, question. And you know I'm not a politician. I'm just uh, studying politics. It's very different. So <laughs> I'm not in a position to say something uh, 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 about this, but I would like to add just uh, a, a few a few ideas. Uh, the challenges the challenges that democracy uh, face uh, <clears throat> uh, are num numerous, and uh, we mentioned the time we need for decision, uh, the necessity to reach consensus, etc. Uh, seen from Europe, there are several other challenges which might be proper to Europe is the uh, demise over decades of the notion of nation boundary identity, uh, increasingly considered in Europe uh, over the last decades as something we should not talk about just as it, if it were a, a dirty subject. And this, by some, uh, to some respect, is, is quite uh, disappointing or, and, and disturbing. And what I see is that the, uh, the, the, the shock, the brutal shock of this attack of Ukraine uh, has, restarted, has restarted the debate on Europe about the validity, the legitimacy of thinking in terms of uh, sovereignty, uh, defending sovereignty, uh, defending uh, the nation and territory, both uh, national and European. That is a, a very interesting development, though it's very, uh, it's, it's just starting. The fact is that um, the war in Ukraine is probably uh, going to, to, to last. I don't know how much time, of course, but uh, the length of this uh, war will probably give us more time and give populations in Europe more time to really assess the uh, gravity of the situation, even though at this moment, minds are very uh, troubled and, and it is very difficult to find a consensus in Europe um, when we talk, for, in, for instance, uh, uh, on, uh, about energy and the consequences in terms of energy in Europe. So overall, I would say optimism is difficult, but because we have no choice, pessimism is forbidden. 
And I hope that democracies will take this crisis as a good, uh, a, a good reason to uh, deepen introspection on how to progress towards a, um, an improved form of democracy. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, thank you for your uh, response. Now, I'd like to uh, first like to acknowledge uh, another uh, distinguished guest uh, on the audience, uh, per, uh, former president of Estonia, uh, Mr. Eves. Uh, so thank, we are thanking him for uh, coming here in person. Uh, he will deliver a keynote speech uh, at the end of the, uh, in, the, in this afternoon. And so we are really glad to uh, have uh, President Eves uh, with us today. And of course, and so, uh, uh, sorry for you had to claim all, you had to go through all the trouble in claiming your uh, luggage back in the back in the air. But yeah, I think that's good. So thank you very much. Now uh, I have been given these questions, uh, but uh, this also has been a little bit elaborated uh, uh, during the Kono Talos, uh, the foreign, the former foreign minister of Japan's speech. He talks about the uh, possibility of the NATO to extend into the Indo-Pacific, or uh, the uh, uh, establishing NATO-like collective security agreement uh, for the Indo-Pacific. So right now we have Japan, we have Australia, uh, we also have the two NATO, uh, NATO nations. Uh, anyone would like to respond? Of course, I will just go back to our defense minister. Uh, definitely, this is your area. Would you like to say something about this? Um, I take up the point that the uh, former Japanese foreign and defence minister made about the possibility of some um, existing body expanding in the Indo-Pacific that would perhaps replicate in some ways what NATO uh, does in, in Europe. Um, I think he referred to JORCAS or sound. Uh, Japan, Australia, UK, US, building on that. There's the Quad where we have India uh, and um, Japan involved in building on that. I think there's an opportunity, uh, perhaps not for just one body, but to have bodies that involve uh, both the military and strategic uh, interests, but also those that involve the economic interests, such as the TPP, as being a vehicle by which like-minded nations can actually work in concert. Um, my sense is that there won't in the short term be one new NATO-like body develop in the region, but there is, I think, great possibility for the expansion of the existing arrangements such as AUKUS, such as the Quad, such as the TPP, um, to involve more countries uh, in a a like-minded endeavour, recognising that countries, even democratic countries, are not homogenous, that they all have different interests and it's a matter of the interplay between those interests. So my sense is that from a practical point of view, there may well be the development of a number of bodies and indeed that may be the most beneficial outcome that recognises that there are different interests between nations, albeit all of a uh, non-authoritarian bent, if I can put it that way. Yeah, thank you, Minister Andrews. Uh, Professor uh, Taniguchi Tomohiko, do you like to re like to say something? Uh, the uh, proposition and also question from Taiwan side as well regarding the uh, possible NATO-like organization established in the Indo-Pacific or the possibility for the NATO ex to extend its coverage into the Indo-Pacific. What is your view about this? First. I must uh, point out that the biggest pillar that sustains the roof of the Indo-Pacific seascape, airscape, remains the US-Japan Security Alliance. Why? Because Japan has continued to provide the United States with the biggest possible footprint of the US military. Put differently, if Washington DC loses Tokyo, the United States should lose almost everything in this part of the world. That uh, strength of bilateral ties sets this region apart 
from Europe and especially pertinent to Taiwan. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, Taiwan is a non state state, non member of the United Nations. Ukraine was a full fledged member of the sovereign system in the world and a full fledged member of the United Nations. Still, because Ukraine failed to earn membership of NATO,、uh, the NATO forces could not have provided security coverage to Ukraine. That's the case. Even if NATO like institution existed in this part of the world, you could not expect that that institution should come to rescue Taiwan. It boils down once again to the strength of the US Japan relationship. And that does not exclude the contributions to be made by Australia. And I gather there is a stronger will and、uh, resolve among Australian、uh, defense planners of、um, uh, making interventions in the Taiwan、uh, contingencies. So,、uh, my point is the crisis scenario around Taiwan is so acute that we don't have luxury to talk about building multilateral institutions from scratch or waiting, waiting, waiting、uh, for an extended period、uh, for the existing、uh, institutions such as NATO to extend its arms to. This part of the world. However, Australia, Japan, South Korea, and some others are already partners of NATO. There must be much, much more exchanges of intelligence, military technologies between and among NATO nations and countries such as Australia and Japan. I, for one, Uh, advocate that uh, AUKUS uh, should include Japan because、uh, Japan and Australia uh, uh, have never been closer as、uh, they are now. And um, uh, Britain has uh, uh, come to show its willingness by dispatching the newly commissioned、uh, aircraft carrier with its、uh, battle force to. This part of the world.、Um, so, um, um, AUKUS、uh, can be developed to include、uh, some, some, some others like Japan. Now,、um, that's、uh, just about it.、Uh, we envy very much the cohesiveness of NATO, but、uh, NATO has its、uh, historical context, which is very much different from、uh, what you have in、uh, this part of the world. Again, Uh, East Asian situation is、uh, potentially very much dangerous.、Uh, you get、uh, Russia, North Korea, China. All those three nations are lining up to counter、uh, the existing、um, regime. So,、um, uh, relevant powers such as Australia, Japan, the United States must consolidate their capacities, their capabilities, and their knowledge. That's、uh, much, much more urgent. Thank you,、uh, Professor Taniguchi and Tomiko, for your remarks、uh, in which、uh, you believe that、uh, the existing organization,、uh, the US Japan Alliance, is critical to Taiwan defense. And、uh, should we want it to extend it、uh, and have a better coverage about the Indo Pacific security in general,、uh, probably from the AUKUS? To extend it so that have a jacuzzi and probably、uh, with other nations,、uh, you think that probably that will be the way forward. So, thank you very much.、Uh, the <coughs>、uh, Professor Kraft、uh, from Germany, you are part of the NATO. What do you think about those questions? Well, I will be very brief as a European、um, uh, observer of,、uh, of, of your region, but I think we can underline the US is crucial. The US is crucial for the security of Asian democracies, but the US is also crucial for European democracies. And um, um, 
Putin takes NATO seriously because of the U.S. Think, think that um, um, that uh, the U.S. would have downgraded their their commitment to Europe uh, in a way which was feared by by Europeans when um, uh, at the time President Obama uh, talked about uh, the pivot to Asia and. Uh, and uh, and Trump uh, uh, talking about uh, NATO being uh, being obsolete. Uh, uh, many Europeans feared that uh, that um, um, the U.S. would abandon us, and thanks God the U.S. didn't. And that's why uh, we have this cohesiveness. Uh, uh, Professor Taniguchi talked about uh, uh, within NATO, and this cohesiveness, this unity, is crucial. And that's why Putin. Is now um, is now uh, respecting respecting uh, the um, the resolve of, uh, of 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 NATO, and um, and uh, um, most likely um, puts this into his calculations about uh, how uh, he will proceed in Ukraine. Of course, nobody can know uh, how actually this this will end. But it would end very quickly if NATO would not stand by uh, the Ukrainians, even without uh, sending troops themselves uh, into into Ukraine. The um, the um, the um, um, the export of military equipment by the U.S. Uh, by many European countries, even smaller countries like uh, the Baltic states or Slovakia. Uh, Poland uh, has been crucial uh, that uh, the um, Ukrainians are able until now to defend themselves against the, the Russian military superiority. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kraft, uh, for your uh, remarks. Uh, Stefan, you'd like to say something? Yes, thank you. Um, history has uh, left, uh, has given us um, regional-based um, military organizations. Um, I'm not sure it's a good thing at this point of history uh, to imagine something more integrated because this would probably divide the world in two blocks and would maybe bring us closer to a global uh, um, war. However, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, every uh, issues. Uh, are, uh, is global now, especially the military ones, and I don't see and I don't see a major uh, conflict in, in in this area in uh, Asia Pacific uh, not affecting Europe. This means that um, NATO being more, more present in uh, Asia in the Asia Pacific region is is something which has to happen because issues are interconnected and no conflict of that size would not impact another region uh, of the world. Um, also, the fact that Taiwan, um, which is um, not a non-state state, I think, but really a sovereign state, uh, the reason that Taiwan cannot or could not easily be included formally or officially in that kind of uh, in, in, the, in the existing schemes uh, in, in Asia, um, is pro it's probably because of uh, the risk of a preemptive action uh, of China if that was to happen. This makes it all uh, the, even more important for other existing military alliance alliances to be involved in the security of the region and the security of Taiwan in particular. So I think it's something which has to happen and it is concretely starting to happen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Stefan, uh, for your remarks. And uh, um, I think that right now, of course, the, uh, the NATO-like uh, discussions in which, of course, uh, Taiwan probably uh, will be long shot for Taiwan to even have any re relevance uh, with the NATO. But uh, I think the discussion raised interest in Taiwan and also in Japan is that the, uh, the need for a, security, a particular security address situation, uh, organization uh, like this to address the, um, uh, the threat from not just about China, 
because uh, there is also the Russian element in it. When we are designing the, uh, uh, the possible war on Taiwan uh, by China, and after the war in Ukraine and the kind of the China-Russia cooperation, some of us started to realize that probably we need to address the Russians as another possible uh, actor, even though not actor, but at least an enabler as well. So that element is something that we never encountered before, and right now started to become a new reality that we have to address. So the, uh, uh, the outlook is not uh, very promising, but uh, we do know that the democracy cooperation is uh, the element for this. And how to cooperate, include Taiwan in this scheme uh, is something that everyone is thinking about how to get that. Uh, not only it could uh, uh, it, uh, strengthen the morale within the society for the defense of democracy, but also it will um, encourage uh, the kind of effort for building the resilience uh, in order uh, for this struggle to continue. Now, I've been uh, reminded that uh, well, we have to adjourn at these sessions because we have another uh, very uh, exciting session to come up. Uh, it will be all congressmen coming out. So that uh, I have to uh, right now <clears throat> uh, announce the, uh, the uh, conclusion of the session. And let's thanks for all the uh, panelists, uh, whether they are in person here at the scene or they are joining us uh, remote online from Japan and from the Hungary. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much. All right, thanks to Dr. Lai for moderating this session. Also, thanks to all the panelists for your uh, valuable comments. <laughs>